Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here at the Idyllic Fort St. Angelo. For those of us who are present with us live and of course those joining online on the digital media platforms, um, it's a great honor for me and for Malta, I would say, to have with us today Mr. John Powell for this event uh, within the framework of the Malta Film Week. Um, Mr. John Powell will be also one of the special guests for tomorrow's, um, for Saturday's actually, uh, Malta Film Awards for the very first edition of the awards. And it's, it's a great honor and pleasure for us to have Mr. Powell, um, who been, has been working with the orchestra, with the Malta Philharmonic Orchestra, and uh, the last couple of weeks also in preparation for this fantastic event. Um, uh, I would like to let Mr. Powell um, introduce himself for, for one very simple reason. Um, we, we, we read about these big names no, a lot of the times, but sometimes when you have such a great man here with such a history and insight on the industry, I mean, it's, it's the best thing to let <laughs> you speak and, and tell us a bit about how, what's behind this. Success story, if we may say. You, you want me to ruin the whole image of what, <laughs> what a Hollywood composer is? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, uh, what is a film composer or who am I? I mean, those are the two questions. I mean, I'm just a kid from England who got very lucky in music and discovered that people in the film industry will pay you to work with amazing musicians and... Uh, uh, you know, get to go places like Malta <laughs> um, because you can write music that fits the film. Um, the purpose of being a film composer is sort of very different depending on which film it is and who you're talking to and why your film thinks it needs mil mu music as opposed to, you know, what we think of as film music. I was going to say, uh, there was a gag about silent movies earlier and you have to understand that the reason we have film music to begin with was that they used to play the piano to, to cover the sound of the projector, which would have been right in the room and with the guy at the back, right at the very beginning of films. It was, it was a terribly pragmatic reason. They had no intention of doing anything emotional with the music. It was purely, well, you know, everyone was sitting there watching the screen in a room and this clanking old projector, they thought, well, how can we make the, the experience a little better? If we play some music, it'll cover the noise. And that's how me film music began. You have to understand that. that was, that's the sole purpose was just to, to stop the noise of the projector. So the fact that we're here talking about it as if it's kind of an art, I think you have to understand that it's a pragmatic art. So that's my introduction, introduction to me and the industry that I'm supposed to be representing again. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things which I'm sure a lot of people um, here uh, in the hall and particular line, we had a lot of requests and, and, and people were really excited about you coming to Malta. Um, there's a, a very strong local indigenous um, sector in this regard and there's a lot of um, talent. So. I'm sure there's a lot of people craving, if I may use the word, um, to, to understand a bit more about the compositional process, how, how, how you get on board on a film, how, how, how you join into the creative process, which involves a lot of practitioners, and how, how the story, I know you're very keen on storytelling via music, how, how, how it develops. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions in there. If you're talking about people who want to be in the industry, it's, it's a very hard industry to get into, I mean, um, or, or be successful at, I suppose. As I say, I, I had an awful lot of luck. I, I had some very good friendships, you know, um, that helps. Um, tenacity is really the biggest talent you need for this industry. Um, but as to what... It, uh, the thing about what the job is and how I really eventually got there was it took me years to realize that I should be a better storyteller almost than a composer. I obviously came into the industry just thinking of it as just being, I was a composer. It was, it was all about music. And it wasn't until I was working with um, George Miller on 
on Happy Feet, where I got kind of this incredible education from him um, about storytelling and the purpose of storytelling for, for us as a, as a society. And then, since then, I've been able to really kind of finally understand why I like music and the, and the storytelling inside music, which is this much vaguer version of it, I think. But uh, we were talking earlier, and for me, a symphonic form, you know, you can say, okay, well, it has an A and a B, and then you develop this, and you can talk about the rigors of composition, why are we doing that? Well, there's lots of reasons that music has evolved that way, but you know, once you get to the Romantic era, you can see that people used form to, to tell stories in a, in a way that when you look at, you know, Joseph Campbell understands the storytelling, you know, the, the idea of myth. When we look at all these stories and how similar they are, we realize they all have a very similar form. And I think that music has been doing this for me my whole life, and I, it was quite late into my <laughs> career in this industry that I realized that those two things are connected. That might be why, maybe early on, I had an instinct for film, for the storytelling in film, and that's why things I was, it was working. Because it wasn't as conscious, perhaps, as once I'd met George Miller and once I really understood what he was trying to say in every moment of his film. And then... So, to younger composers, the question is, I've been asked, is like, where do I go to college, what should I do? And I, I've always said, well, I'm not sure music college is actually as useful as drama college or film school. You know, I'd start, I'd start by assuming that you can write music and that you're, you're musical and you're, you're good at manipulating music. But then the thing that filmmakers need, and as you said, there's a lot of people involved in film, it's the, it's one of the ultimate sort of collaborative arts. Um, what they need is they need a translator of music because it's, it's this bizarre language that we all understand but very few people speak. Um, and we need somebody to be able to understand what the story is. I mean, literally what the story is. And sometimes it's, I've found that filmmakers themselves don't understand their own stories. So the first thing I do with a filmmaker, if they hire me, <laughs> is... I do a thing called um, what we call a spotting session, which is where you go through the movie and you decide where music goes, where it starts, where it stops. Well, I've since renamed that the interrogation session, <laughs> where I actually ask, why is this scene here, and what does it do for the story, and why do you want music here, or not? And it's amazing. Some filmmakers kind of, uh, their eyes open and they they realize <laughs> they've never really been asked that question in, in, in terms of, you know, you're right at the end of the process, you know, and they've shot everything, they've edited it together, everything else is almost there, you're almost to the finish line and somebody is coming along and saying, well, if you want me to put music there, you have to tell me why, you know, not from a point of view, why do you want music, Be to make it more emotional, yeah, I, everybody knows that, but what is this story, what is this scene to the story, what does it really mean? Why is it there? And then I'll understand sort of what the music can do or shouldn't do or, can, or can't do. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why music works in a film, as I was saying, just to cover up the noise of the projector. It's like, sometimes it's like sort of, um, it can be glue, it can slow a story down. You know, or it can be like grease and, and things flow, you know, action films in particular. I mean, I think that was one of the things I was probably good at on The Born Identity, was I seemed to hit the right stuff that just gets get an otherwise very, very carefully sort of very slow story, really. If you look at The Born films, they're actually quite slow. Um, but we found, you know, I, I think Doug Lyman was able to sort of and he was never able to really say it. He was just, he, he's a great filmmaker, because so he, so he steers you in this kind of, in this unusual way that you don't really understand, but you, he steers you towards things. Um, so those, those questions of what the filmmaker is trying to say about music is almost impossible, because it's an impossible language to talk about. Um, the thing you have to always ask yourself is that, do we all understand the story? Because we're all trying to make the same story. And if you do, then you have a chance. 
you still might not be able to write the right music. There's all sorts of hurdles then as to, you know, do you want a symphony orchestra or do you want, uh, you know, a drum machine? And both can effectively help tell the story for very different reasons. And it comes down to style and taste and all these things that are kind of ephemeral and you can't really, you can't necessarily say, well, you're wrong because you don't like classical music or you're wrong because... I don't do classical music. There's, there's all sorts of, sort of arguments you can make about what kind of music, but at least if you all agree why the story needs it, then at least you have a chance. That's, I think that's, over these years, I've finally got to the point where I almost understand what I'm supposed to be paid for. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned, and uh, whilst I, I was preparing for this um, masterclass seminar, um, how close collaboration there is with the filmmaker in the music creative process. Um, and what struck me was a particular thing you said, which was that um, sometimes it might feel as if it's not making sense for you musically and you might lose something you're quite keen. Um, so how important is in the development of, of the whole structure and the whole soundtrack, so to speak, um, uh, this, this continuous liaison with, with uh, filmmaker and, and all the creatives on, on yeah. board. It's a, it's a wonderful and terrible sort of thing where you, you're, putting your, you're putting your life in each other's hands. You know? A filmmaker, if you have any idea <laughs> what it takes to start to make a film, you know, the, there are a thousand stories, there are a thousand scripts right now that are about to be made, and you could probably end up, five of them will be. You know, the potential energy of, film, of filmmaking is, is giant. The actual happening of it is, <laughs> is amazingly low. It's very hard to make films. They're very expensive. They require so many people, so many things to line up. It is always amazing how many terrible films there are, if you think about it. But <laughs> nobody wants to make a terrible film. And that's the thing. Every great story can devolve into a terrible film. It's very easy. It's, it's amazing how often it happens. Now, I've been on a, quite a few of them. Um, <laughs> and nobody in it was going, yeah, let's make this, let's make Gili terrible, you know. We all thought it was going to work. I mean, you slowly realize it's not working sometimes, and you still have to keep going, but there's no, there's no rhyme or reason as to why film happened. So filmmakers, it's taken a lot to get to this point at which they're now spending even more money on some guy to come along and, and write music for the film. And it might not be right. I mean, there's a reason why Quentin Tarantino hasn't used film you know, composers very often. It's a really hard thing for him to sort of give over his film to somebody else. So it's, it has to be this two-way respect of how kind of hard it is for both of you. For the composer, it's hard because I always think the job is to reach in as deep as you can and squeeze your heart and try and get something very powerful out. You know, if it's simple but powerful or, you know, giant but powerful, you're trying to get a very strong emotion out of yourself. So you have to make that happen. And sometimes that takes a lot of kind of emotional strength and emo emotional kind of, um, um, you know, sort of, I don't know, um, games with yourself. You have to sort of play around with your own kind of responses to the, to the imagery to try and get the right music out and get something very powerful out. Now you do all that and then the filmmaker will come along and go, no, I don't like it. And that's just a knife in the heart because you've had to put it out, and you've done your best, you've reached in, you've found every sort of deep secret and every sad moment in your life and every dog's death and, you know, and every um, sort of cruel, jeering moment. And you've looked and you've tried to create something that evokes all of that. You've used your own sort of life to do it. As actors, you know, we are basically like a we weird actors sometimes who are sort of told to sort of emote. And then, like with actors, you emote and then they'll go, no, can do it again. Because <laughs> you're not really sure sometimes if what you're bringing out is what anybody asked for. I mean, the, the number of times 
you do something and, and you say, and the, and the filmmaker asks you, can you, I need something very sad and emotional here, and you write it, and they say, hey, we quite like this piece, but could it be sad and emotional? And, and you're sort of thinking, I thought I did that, but mm, <laughs> didn't. So, that, so then you kind of, you crank it up, and it's even more sad and emotional, and the, and the filmmaker says, no, 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 no. It, I like, still like it's fine, but it's it, but sad and emotional. And then you look at it and you say, I think I'm in the slightly wrong universe here in my interpretation of what sad and, and emotional is. And that's when you realize that two words mean very different things to very different people, as le at least in the history of their, their history of music. Because we all have a history of music, as in every piece you've ever heard has made you feel something. And you could listen to something and feel sad and emotional about it, and another person feels joy and, you know, and, um, and uh, laughter. It just depends on the, your relationship with that music at the time. So it's actually amazing how non-universal music is sometimes, and the, which is the wonderful thing about it is we can interpret it any way we want. Um, a lot of, you know, Penderecki. Mm -hmm. This is the weird thing about Penderecki, which is very weird, strange music. Um, people have been putting it into horror films. I mean, obviously, uh, Stanley Kubrick has. It's very disturbing for some people. I actually find it very, very beautiful, and I think Penderecki meant that as well. I mean, it, it's extraordinarily beautiful music. It's not tonal music, and it doesn't do the same thing that, you know, that Vaughan Williams does, but it's very, very beautiful, the way it's constructed and, and thing. But if you find that music creepy, and I find it beautiful, can you imagine the conversation in the, <laughs> you know, when we're on the scoring stage? You know, so this, this wide... You know, the two things that you have, you and the filmmakers, are in each other's hands. But you also have to understand that it's the communicative language that you're trying to use is broken. It's broken before you begin. Because it really is about everybody's experience. So you put a piece of your music to a pic, to an imagery, and you bring your whole life to it. It means something to you in the way, and you think it's doing things, and everybody else can look at it very differently. So you, there's, it's, it's su such an inexact sort of science that what you have, the main thing you have to be willing to do is do it again, and do it again, and try, and, and experiment, and play, and, and put everything you can into it, but then immediately take that sort of rejection not as a rejection of the music itself, but as a rejection of its relationship to the film and the relationship of the film and the filmmaker and what the filmmaker wants to feel with that relationship. And that's a very different thing. That's something that's, that's, that's very thin and light and doesn't hurt you at all if, if, you, if you break that, that relationship between what the film is doing and what your music is doing together. It doesn't, that's not going to hurt you at all. What hurts you is if you think that the comment that they're making is a reflection of the music that you've drawn up out of your deepest, deepest psyche and sadnesses. And then somebody tells you it's shit because, you know, it doesn't do what they want. So, and, you know, it, this is great. I wish, I'd, I wish I'd had this conversation with myself like 20 years ago because 20 years ago, I, I was, it's heartbreaking the number of times I've, I, you know, wanted to kill filmmakers because because they didn't like things and I didn't understand what they were saying to me. You know? So I think that's, that's one of the key things that I've learned. Um, how uh, intrinsic is this link between um, music and, and what appears on screen, whether it's, it's TV or whether it's films? How, how important, w what role does music land in, in this whole process of storytelling? Um, I'm asking also the question in view of the fact that um, uh, sometimes, uh, of course, I'm coming from the music industry, so I'm a bit biased, let's put it that way. Um, uh, we tend to like, look at, okay, then we'll see what we can fit in musically. How, how crucial is it that music um, uh, positions itself as a leading factor in, in telling this, this whole story? Uh, yeah. Well, it's a good question, and, and one of the answers is it depends on which year you're talking about, and whether you're talking about now or 10 years ago or 50 years ago. I mean, taste in film music has changed. If I go back to the idea that, that you're playing the piano to c 
cover up the noise of the projector. Um, the next step you, they had was, well, if you're playing piano and there's a romantic scene, why not play some Beethoven? Why not play, um, you know, uh, something romantic that sort of seems, seems to fit it? And that was literally how we got going. So then there's a train chase, you know. So why not play some, I don't know, um, you know, uh, something quick and sort of exciting uh, from the classical repertoire. So there used to be these books that, uh, that the accompanists, you know, the, the pianists had, where they could look up and immediately flick to another section. So it would just have all these... And it was all from classical music. It was all Beethoven, you know, um, Brahms. And so you'd flick around and you'd just find, you know, a piece of greed that was a bit dark for something, you know, scary. And then you'd flip back when it was funny and you'd have you know, something light and silly that was all, all from the existing repertoire. So it, it is actually very basic. It's at the bottom of what film scoring has become. And there's everything you could <laughs> need to know, is it, I would say, is in um, Peter and the Wolf. I mean, how, what Prokofiev did. And by the way, Prokofiev was writing film scores. You know, he wrote a lot of film scores that we, we don't know. You know, Peter and the Wolf has got everything you could kind of do for any animation film ever. And it was. I mean, you can hear it all in that. It's, it describes very clearly. The other one uh, I often use is Benjamin Britten's um, uh, Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, which has just got every, every sort of texture you could ever need as well, uh, all in there. So the question is nowadays, today, knowing that, you know, People make films with music incredibly diversely. You know the difference between a sort of a, I don't know, a, a Marvel film and you know Licorice Pizza and you know Power of the Dog. And so you know very different approach. Even though same composer, <laughs> but um, a lot of needle drops. You know how we respond to music with film is just endlessly sort of possible. I mean, that's the thing. It can be paradoxical. You know, in, in um, Reservoir Dogs, when the, the ear cutting, you know, you have fun music. Paradox. It makes it kind of more horrific. Now, that was not done until really a lot later than we think. I don't, nobody did that in the 30s and the 40s, the 50s. I mean, maybe... I mean, I, I remember watching a lot of Jean-Luc Godard um, films and it, it always seemed to me that he just mused, he used music just to sort of distract you uh, as well. Um, there have been so many amazing experiments in, in in some films that when we don't know, and sometimes there's there's amazing experiments that work really well, and then there's people who do it really elegantly, and then there's people who do it badly. You know, the truth is there's a lot of there's been a lot of terrible film music that's either worked or not worked. So there's two elements. Which is, is it good for the film? Is it good music? Those two things do not have to... They don't really have to be the same. If it works for the film, then you've done your job. If it's shitty music, but it works for the film, I don't think we should worry too much about it because, again, that's what's required. It's, you know, so nowadays you have very minimalistic music sometimes. Um, you know, if you think about, uh, you know... A, Scores by, um, you know, in the in the thirties, forties. I mean, they were really complex, and they were going for it the whole time during dialogue and all sorts of things. It's very. Now we have a real issue with that, which is there's a lot of information. You know, you do not want complicated music going while, especially while people are uh, are trying to explain the backstory of why some magical egg can give everybody the power that to uh, destroy the universe. You, know, you have to be careful about these things. So there's all these kind of pragmatic sides of it. But it's an impossible question to ask me. It's like, what does music really do? Because everybody in the audience will have their own opinion of what music does and depends on whether it's this week uh, where you see something new or whether you see something that's worked a thousand times before as well. There are some... Perhaps there are some universals you can talk about. Is that, yeah, some things, you know, a major key versus a major chord versus a minor chord, which one's sadder? Well, it gets really difficult to just, just talk about that. It's like, you know, Thomas Newman, 
that's the amazing thing about Thomas Newman. He, he, he gives an incredible sense of melancholy with way more major chords than anybody would have ever imagined. I think that's one of the sounds of the, the, and the genius of Tom, Tom's music. Um, and then there's other times when you can do plenty of minor chords, but if you put enough sort of kinetic energy into it, it's actually jolly. You know, if you think of like wonderful sort of fast horrors, horrors from you know kind of Eastern European sort of music, folk music, they're all hellishly dark harmonically and melodically, but the band is like cooking, and so it sounds great fun because it makes you want to dance. So it, there's a really that's a really tough question for me to ask. <laughs> Answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. I think. Um, Related to this, um, uh, the, you mentioned uh, action, you mentioned animation, uh, movies. Um, conceptually, for you, when, when, when you've got uh, a film which you need to score for, um, what are like um, the main trigger points? What inspires your, your creativity? I know in the hall you've got a lot of film composers who would be very keen to have an insight into... What? Yeah, me. <laughs> if you can allow us a small peep into. Well, me, I, I don't know. Again, it, dep it depends which point in my career and what I'd sort of explored and what I'd tried and what I'd enjoyed. It seems as if I do seem to like writing for animation. Um, because I think animation, at least, you know, has a lot of the stuff I've done has been constructed in a way that has more room and more need for uh, sort of melodic, large melodic scores. And that triggers me into sort of a, um, a zone that I enjoy, I've enjoyed writing in. But if you think of, you know, the, the Bourne stuff, I mean, that was, that was uh, deliberately kind of minimalistic, uh, way more than at the time, simply because I was kind of trying to help define the film as as different from, so sometimes being kind of the negative of what everybody expects is actually as creative as doing what everybody expects. So, and I enjoyed that because I, you know, at the time I'd been listening to a lot of Massive Attack and, and Bjork and, and Philip Glass. You know, I'd always been into Philip Glass and Steve Reich. So minimalism and some of the very minimalistic kind of, um, you know, pop music at the time that was developing on the outer, outer reaches of pop music had fascinated me for years, and so I was probably quite keen to see if I could make some of that, experiment with it. And then the director comes along and says, the one thing that this cannot be is like Bond. And I love James Bond, <laughs> so, um, so I'm, you know, yes, you've, you've, got, you've got a sort of a, a thriller that's, that's like a James Bond character, but you cannot, be jump, you cannot sound even remotely like Bond. It was kind of, it was a slightly heartbreaking because you want the gig, um, and but then you realise I actually have to do something that's totally different. And but that's okay because then you can work sort of in the opposite direction. You know what is not wanted is almost as important as what is wanted. Again, for the reasons that music is so hard to talk about, it's like it's, I always prefer people that say I don't know what I want, but I know it can't be this, this or this. You must always assume, though, that it could be one of those things. For the way that's, that's an aside to it is that when people say they don't want something, it's probably the case, but under the certain circumstances, they might be wrong. And one of your jobs is to sort of give everybody options to see if they really mean that. And sometimes they do, and they think you're an idiot because you, you I said, don't do that, and you've done it. And you know, I'd say three times out of five they're right, but two times out of five, they're, they're very pleased where, when, you, when you play it to them, they, you know, they realize, ah, oh, under these circumstances, that might work. But certainly in, 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 in films, it, it's, it's just about, I don't know, finding something that works, you know, just for everybody in the room sometimes. It's, it's very basic, you know, it is very basic. It's not like, you know, you have to, think sort of in seven directions at, at, at the same time, there's often a very simple solution to these things. Um, but the things that trigger me are probably all the stuff that you've heard from me. I've 
been lucky enough to sort of push myself into into the world where that is required. Um, and it doesn't mean I don't enjoy doing other things, but I seem to enjoy certain types of music other way, you know, more. And if they work in animation films, then I'm more likely to be attracted to animation films. Um, uh, before we get on, uh, some questions from the hall, because I'm sure there are people keen to ask. Um, a final question from my end in this regard. Um, you're mentioning quite a lot um, eminent, so to speak, classical music. Uh, before we were talking about Brahms, uh, mentioning glass, so kind of mainstream composers from the, let's say, uh, symphonic, classical symphonic. How, how different or how not different are these two sides of music and, and, and how, how they link. Uh, I know, um, also speaking to our mutual friend, Maestro Christian Shu, and how mm. keen you are um, into orchestration and, and, and knowing uh, the little peculiarities of each particular instrument. Um, if you can share a bit more about this link and uh, why it's so important, or if it's not there at all? Well, I think, you know, I'm a composer, but there's lots of different ways of writing music, I think. Um, and I've always felt that the greatest, the greatest sort of gift I was given was to hear a lot of music um, and, and, and play some, you know, play a lot when I was younger. Um, I wasn't a terribly good player, but I, I got good enough to sort of be able to experience orchestral music from the inside, um, the viola section, which I think is by far the best place to be in the orchestra. Really? Yeah, I know, because generally it's easier, <laughs> okay, except most of the viola parts I write, I couldn't play. Um, and, and also you get to sort of sit in the middle, so you get a much better balance of everything. Right? So you, you know, if, especially if you get to about the second desk of the violas, you're right under the conductor. You don't have to lead, so nobody cares about you. <laughs> and, um, and you get to hear all, everything else kind of... So I think my orchestration was really sort of formed between sort of 14 and 20 when I was playing in a youth orchestra in the viola section. Um, and that's useful, but... it. If you've been brought up on a different type of music, you know, you see music through, a, a, you know, through your life and your experiences to it. Um, I had a very somewhat limited experience until I kind of became a teenager and then went to college. And when I went to college, I, I heard different types of music because the college had a, a, a big library of, of, um, of world music, which was hard to find at the time, you know. Um, and that opened my eyes. And then I realized, and then I needed a job, so I played in a band that played 60s soul music. And, and then things lead where they go. And then before you realize it, there's this giant world of music. Um, I loved lots and lots of different types of music. Lots of different types of music. I find exactly the same joy in, in the Rite of Spring as in, you know, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Aretha Franklin. I mean, it, it, it sounds the same to me. It, it feels the same to me, perhaps. You, obviously, it sounds different, but it feels the same. I get the same sort of experiential, I don't know, um, joy. I mean, even when it's sad, you know, it's, it's, it's always a, a, a joyful feeling when I, when I hear music that's doing something to me. So whether it's this or this, it doesn't matter to me. And I, some things I might be better at doing, but I always love to have a go at anything. So for me, I've tried everything I can, and probably Hollywood has found things that I do, certain things I do more useful. The, you know, the other things I might have not done as well so that they sort of, I don't get you know, drawn into that, but I must be quite good at certain things. But it does all come down to lots and lots of details that you're interested in, you know, and um, I call them fetishes, musical fetishes. The things that just will never let you go, you know, it's just I'll always remember, you know, that particular type of 
writing for trumpet and that particular writer, you know, that that piece, the way that the harp and the clarinet work, you, know, you can't sort of really identify why any of these things hit you at the time and why they stay. Um, but so then there's all there's this giant buckets of great things to sort of find in your own musical history, and that's all I've ever done. I've, I just plunder, I plunder the you know this pot of fun things that um, whether they're you know really specific a few bars or whether they're an arch form within Brahms, um, and I just keep going along. I search from one to the next to the next, and I just try and... Also, the other thing I always tell people is that I have a very faulty memory, and that's very useful as well, because even if I try and remember, you know, one section of, of um, Young Person's Guide to the, you know, the orchestra, I always... I can never quite remember it well enough, so it always comes out a bit wonky. And then, it, and then I stick something else with it, and then before you know it, it's dissipated as itself, and it's become something else. I think so. The, my compositional style is to sort of just, just try and bring up anything I think that sounds interesting to me, which means that I must have liked it originally, and then and then mash them together, or you find them, you know, stretch them out, or slow them down, and things change. Am I distorting? Everybody's looking worried. <laughs> yeah, so the foot pedal. There's nothing quite like fuzz boxes as well. I mean, I have loads of them at home as well. <laughs> we could do experiments. Um, but I don't know, did I answer that question? I can't remember. I went off on it. I mean, it, if nothing else you'll learn is that my style of writing music is all about tangents. <laughs> like, as is my speaking technique. So. Um, I think it's a good moment to um, open discussion to the floor um, as we're talking a bit about this whole creative process, uh, yeah. if you may call it that way. Um, I see a lot of friendly faces, people who are very curious to ask questions, for sure. Um, so if anybody wants to ask anything... It's actually hard to know if they're friendly with the masks on. Yeah. <laughs> The eyes usually give the game away, no? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just in conducting an orchestra in New York, and it was the first sessions I'd done where they had masks on. And I, I like to try and joke with the orchestra, and I'm not sure if they found anything funny because they all had masks on. And so I, I, it's like being at a really, really tough stand-up cl club with, with an orchestra. <laughs> so, but, oh, we've got some. Yes. Doesn't sound like it. Right. And three, three layers, so you can attack it at any any level as we go down. Do you ever come into the composition um, approach thinking, okay, this is a particular kind of film, and therefore, according to its genre, there's a specific kind of score I need to deliver to this? And then from there down, do you ever hit the situation where your director says to you, thank you for the score, but this is not the kind of movie I thought I'm making, and it needs to be more this or more that? And then next level down, do you and the director ever come to sort of agreement, but then at a third level, the studio comes back to you and says, this is not the way we think we're marketing this movie. This is not the kind of thing we think we're putting out into the market. And therefore, you need to go back and, and change the kind of score according to a different perception of genre that we think we're marketing. Yes. To all three, absolutely. Um, just remind me, what was the first one again? <laughs> well, do you ever come into a situation with a well, clear understanding I that like I know that. what the genre is? Yes. You spoke about the pragmatic idea yes. of, of, you know, there's a Beethoven for this because it's romantic or it's, a, it's, a, it's an action thing, so it's got to be a different kind of more speedy, yeah. happy sort of score. Yeah, genre is a, good, is a good word because that's, you know, it's a very easy way, way of defining film. I mean, we have genres. And in those genres, you also have genres. So you have a sort of nests of genres as far as you know, action films. Um, say, the question is, yes, do you look at a film and you go, okay, well, I think I know what this film is. 
even if it's a genre film and you say, okay, well, it's, I'm not exactly going to make it sound like Downton Abbey because there's too many deaths happening in, in, with large machine guns, you know. It's just, it feels out of genre. You, you mustn't kind of fall into the trap of just walking into a film thinking that because it seems to be that thing, it is. That helps me kind of, that helps me feel a bit more, uh, you know, open to experiment. And I think I enjoy that. And I, generally, I find filmmakers enjoy me experimenting. At a certain point, I always promise people, okay, well, let's say we've got 12 weeks to do this. If we spend eight weeks doing what we think it's going to be good for, what could be really work, let's play around for eight weeks. Because if you hate it all, I, you'll still give me four weeks to then do what probably we think it, it probably should have been once we realised that the experiments weren't necessary or they weren't really helping us. So I try and sort of leave enough time to redo the whole thing. And that brings me to point two and three, which is that sometimes the director can get to week nine and say, you know, this, is, this has all been very interesting, but I think we should go back and do this. And so now I've got four weeks to do that. It gets tricky if you then do that and you get to week 11 and then the studio finally hears everything and says, um, I think you and the director are wrong and this should have been this, this other thing. And yes, that happens all the time. And I have been there on the dub stage with the head of the studio and a director screaming at each other. And the problem about being the composer is you are the last person who can change the movie for them. Either side. They can change the marketing techniques, yeah. They can realise they don't have a romantic comedy, they have a, a vampire movie that's dark and sad. Um, and then they can change marketing for that. But the other thing you can do is you can change, you, to a certain extent, you can change how the, feel, how the film works in its in its overall feeling, if you, if you push one way, push another. Now, if you're pushing too hard in the direction that the film will never take because the studio wants it to be one thing and it never will be, there's nothing really much you can do and you often end up hurting the film more um, and it will, that will drive it into the ground because you can hear the composer trying to be something that the film isn't. And we've all seen those films and I've done the scores for a few of them. Um, and so... And sometimes you can really help the relationship between the director and the, and the studio by negotiating kind of a, a, you know, a terms of what it could be. And sometimes it doesn't take much. You know, something that the filmmaker really liked in your score that is really irritating the, the studio because they think it's sticking out and driving everyone mad but the director light, you know, you can negotiate. Well, it's not going to be this, but I'll make, what if I change that instrument to this instrument? So there's a lot of work you can do to help everybody kind of get comfortable with it. But yes, I, I think one of the things you need to hold in your head is that it could be that none of us know how this film works or what it is or what is going to be best for it until it's done. And if you think of the very nature of film, you go to the cinema and you watch it, it's done, it's finished. Okay, now you have to wind back and go, well, now we've just got words on a page. And now we've got a crew and we've got cameras and we've got actors. And now we've got footage uh, and we can edit it, we can change it. Now we've got it edited, we can put totally different music on it and we can colour time it and we can change it and we can saturate it and we can make it do... And then it, literally the last things are you can edit and you can change the music. And at a certain point, those two things run out of time, depending on which one it is. I mean, I remember the third, which one was it? The second Bourne movie? I, I, no, maybe not. I've been on a couple of films where the, the final dub, which is the last chance to get everything finished, the sound is all being done. There really isn't much you can do after that. The final dub was two days away and they were still shooting and they were doing reshoots and the, mu the music had to be written for the reshoots which meant that you know 
you know, two, I think I finished a few cues that didn't really get approved until the printmaster, which is just like crazy. And if out of 64 films I've done, I've only ever done one that is not, that the edit hasn't changed while I was writing it or after I've written it. Um, only one. And so the world now is that everything can change at the last minute, but really the thing that can affect it the most sometimes is the music. So you do get drawn into these very difficult com conversations where everybody thinks that you can help, and you can, or, or you can't, can't, depending on the film. <laughs> so... Thank you. We've got another question. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you for this discussion. It was very interesting. Um, what I was wondering is because at the beginning of the discussion, you mentioned how at the start of the process, you meet up with the filmmaker and you see his vision. Now, when it comes to composing, how do you manage to find that balance and that compromise between his vision and your vision as well? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think the filmmaker's vision is, uh, you know, is, is, is not really his, you know, their vision until it's all done, you know. We, as I was saying, you, you start a film by having nothing, <laughs> and then you have something, and then you have the film, and you hope to get from nothing to a great film. And there's many things that might stop it. Um, so what is the vision? The vision is a sort of a hope. It's like, I'm hoping it will feel like this. Um, so the only thing you can do is experiment, I think. You know, and sometimes you experiment with the temp. A lot of filmmakers put temp music in. Um, and that's good and bad for composers because uh, it's good because sometimes you can roll up and a lot of films are kind of done. They know what they want. And the temp is there and it's like, all right, well, I can do something like that, sure. Um, or they have tried temp and none of the temp works and they, and they really don't know what can work and it's always feeling off. And there could be that just nobody has found the right temp or nobody's written the right music for it. So you do have this chance sometimes to write music that, that hits a particular place in, in the cracks that, that bridges some really weird paradox that musically doesn't, hasn't been found to be existing, that something that fitted, you know, it might have part of the right mood, but it's always too fast, or it's always in doing something else that's unnecessary. So the idea is to actually create that thing that really sits right, and sits in there and, and makes everybody happy, of course. The negotiation can be hard, because as I said earlier on, it's like, I, I want purple, I give them purple, they ask for purple, I give them purple, and they say, no, this is green. And you say, well, it looks purple to me. That doesn't really do anybody any good, because, I mean, we all have different sort of opinions of these things. So I try and, I do try and um, use the film itself as an entity that I can then, we can all talk about, so to, take, to try and remove everybody's ego out of this. Is the, what, what is the film sort of needing? Why is it, the, we, always say, no, the film's throwing it off. As in, it's not, the film itself is not accepting this piece of music. <laughs> um, that's one way of a filmmaker, you know, understanding that it's not about their ego, it's not about your ego. We are all trying to kind of come to the same place. Um, but it is hard, it is very hard. I mean, you just have to know that I, one of the things I've, I've said is you, you have to join a director in their madness sometimes. If they're going to go crazy, you either fight them all the time, and what, what are you doing when you fight them? It's like, well, you're wrong, and this, somebody's saying to you, I want to try and creatively do something that is just unusual and doesn't, isn't in the mainstream and, and hasn't been done before and is different from what you'd expect. And then you try that, and it's very hard because it's different, <laughs> it's not what you expect. And so there's, n there's no kind of, there's no rails to put it on. There's no, nothing that you expect about it. And you, then you're not sure if it's working. And then everybody gets very nervous. And, and you can have this mass hysteria about these things where we're all trying to sort of work out, is this right, is this wrong? I, 
at a certain point, I really don't know. And if the filmmaker's uncertain, that's hard. But if, the, if you don't agree with them and you think they're mad, you've either got two choices, which is either you get out of the way and let them find a way of doing it, or you try and help them. Now, if you think, well, the only way I can help them is by making them understand how wrong they are, I mean, what fucking thing is that? That's not useful. Well, you know, why would they want you to do that? They've got a million other people who are telling them that shit. I can tell you, like, they don't want the composer doing that. But what you can do is you can say, all right, I really don't understand what you're after, but let's try some things and see what happens. Uh, or you just completely drink the Kool-Aid and you just go for it. And I've had to try all of those sort of things, and some of them I've messed up, and some of them I've done well, and some of the relationships I've messed up, some of the relationships I've kept well. Uh, but it, it's, it's a collaboration, which <laughs> means that, yeah, you can take the thing, well, they're my boss. You can either go, yes, they're my boss. But they're your boss, but they're also somebody that you can bring something to that isn't in the, jo in, isn't in the job description. If a, if a director knew exactly what to tell you and exactly how to put the music in the film, they would. Hence, Quentin Tarantino. Most of his stuff is exactly what he wants because he's heard it and he's found it and he's put it in the right... It, it works that way. Everybody else is generally kind of hoping. So you have to sort of keep that hope alive. I think that's a good way of putting it. Do we have... Yeah, we've got... Two more questions before we move on to the next topic. First of all, thank you for your inspiration in music. Um, as a composer, you inspire me a lot. Uh, my favorite genre is animation as well. Uh, my question for you would be, when it came to scoring How to Train Your Dragon, what was your greatest challenge, if any? <laughs> Um, I think the biggest challenge was that I'd done a lot of films uh, for Jeffrey Katzenberg, who basically sort of really got me a career as well, helped me get a career right from the very beginning. The very first thing I ever did in Hollywood was help out on doing arrangements on songs for Prince of Egypt with Jeffrey, and, and the first film that DreamWorks, DreamWorks Animation had ever created. Um, obviously, Hans was really doing it all, but I was in there helping out. And and uh, Jeffrey was wonderful right from the get-go. He's tough, he's very tough, but get-go. So I do all of these films. Um, and then, for various reasons, Shrek comes along, and I kind of like... Um, there's a famous moment when Jeffrey Katzenberg said to me, if you're going to behave like that, you should join the New York Ballet. And I never really quite understood what I think he meant was I was being a diva. <laughs> which is a slight confusion of, of, of genres. But, so at that point, I then got, got benched from, from DreamWorks Animation. Um, and I didn't see them for a while. I went off and did some other animation and, and got into uh, some great films that I loved. But then later on, the, the great thing was that he, he let me come back for, um, uh, with hands to help out on... Uh, Kung Fu Panda, which was just great fun. And we had great fun on that. So then it came, after Kung Fu Panda, this film came up, and, and he asked me if I'd like to do it. And Hans wasn't around, and Harry Gregson Williams wasn't around, so I, it was one I would get to do on my own. And I'd done lots of films on my own, there was, and including animation films, but I'd never done one on my own at DreamWorks. So um, I definitely had a kind of a, I need to prove something to my father moment, I think, um, <laughs> on, on, on that one. So I'd like to think that that was a little bit of what probably made me work a bit harder on it, but it probably was just a really good film. And I know that the filmmakers were really so, such wonderful people to sort of to, to inspire. I mean, I think... That's the thing you're looking for. You're looking for, at the same time as being a film composer and being pragmatic, you're still looking for inspiration because that will hopefully generate something good out of you. 
because you're trying to bring the, breath, the best out of you. They want the best out of you as well, but the question is how do you bring the best out of a composer? Can, you can scare them into writing well, you know, I mean, sometimes that happens. You can leave them alone to, you know, to, to write them well. That, sometimes that can be a disaster, I, or it can work. In some cases, what you're looking for is just the right balance of kind of, this is what we're doing, this is how well we understand it, and then there's this indescribable thing that some people have, good directors, good filmmakers, good anybody, good people, good hosts, you know, are good at making you feel very comfortable, but also make you want to search in a more kind of, I don't know, honest way inside yourself. And, and you, or, or it's luck, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the chemistry that we have with each other, it's the communication skills, or or just the way that everything kind of intertwines and me trying to impress Jeffrey, great filmmakers, a really wonderful you know, kind of world that, I, that seemed to make sense to me, and also the request to write perhaps more Celtically, which I hadn't done a lot, but was actually like falling off a log because my childhood had had a lot of that. My, my grandmother came from um, a place that looks very like Burke, you know, in the Northern Hebrides. Um, and I'd always played on the fiddle, I'd played spades and reels, which is like Scottish folk music for her because she liked it. Um, and so I had a sort of this weird background that I didn't really think about a lot in that kind of music. So maybe it was a mixture of all those things and that's why it kind of worked well. Um, I mean, I'd like to think that I try that hard on every film, uh, but certainly that one worked rather well rather better, it seems, than other ones, because people really like that one. When everyone picks that one out, the thing I always have to say is, and what's wrong with all the others? <laughs> you know, uh, that, so that's how egotistical composers are, by the way, in case you didn't know. Uh, I've got a final question at the moment. Hi. Um, uh, you spoke a lot about new movies and new compositions and uh, genres. I wonder how the process is. Um, uh, is different maybe to the continuation of certain genres. For example, Solo, a Star Wars story. How do you approach that, uh, given that Star Wars has kind of like a um, musical kind of theme, both rhythmically and harmonically? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Solo was a really interesting one because it was, um, it was sort of, it was like, it felt like the history of film music. Uh, and it was something that I wasn't quite sure, A, if I was up to, I had a terrible, terrible time. I mean, I got, uh, um, I got, I got all of John Williams's kind of short scores um, from the first three movies, which don't ask me for. I can't give you the movie. They are, you know, they're, <laughs> they're just quite brilliant. Honestly, quite brilliant. And the more and more I looked at them, I, the more I dived into a deep, dark hole that I thought I'd never get out of. I almost really didn't make it at all on that one. I mean, apart from also they changed directors and all this kind of thing, I thought, oh, I'm going to get fired. And then they kept me on, and then I thought, as we got really close, I, I, I just can't, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It was a real interesting one, because I was so admiring of what John had done. It was so clearly <laughs> at a, such an incredible level. I just didn't know what I could do to it. And... Um, and so I, I wrote things, I wrote a lot of things, but I never dared play them to anybody at that point. Until John came back into, he came into the process, and the idea was he was going to write, you know, a tune. Um, and he wrote a couple of tunes. And I went to see him at his uh, house, and he played these things to me on, on the piano. Um, and it sort of just all clicked. I just realized, <laughs> okay, we're fine, we've got that. We've got that. So now I know where the islands are. And I felt that I would then be able to figure out how to bridge things and, and sort of... And then I started to look at all the material I'd done and I saw it through a very different lens. It wasn't that it was shit compared with his music. <laughs> it was that it was... It was aside it. It was to the side of it. It was different, but it was... It was coming out of the same place emotionally. I was trying to sort of say the same things I was trying to do, but it perhaps wasn't quite the same. And, and so once I knew that 
what John had done was sort of so solid and was so there. And, and it wasn't just exactly, it wasn't exactly, you know, out of Star Wars. It was, it was very clearly John Williams, but it was, you know, it was, it was new material. Uh, I kind of then, I was, it felt like I, I had a place to sort of grow towards that and away from it and things. And it just, it, it steadied me. And, and, I, and then it was a joy to do, having been almost a disaster. Not that anybody knew that. I mean, this is all stuff you keep completely right, under your hair, so they can't see. Um, but uh, it was a hard one to do because I really sort of didn't feel worthy in the cliche of it because it, it really is amazing watching somebody or looking at something when, when, when you see what they've done and it's really good. I, I mean, I'd like to think that like me, John Williams has these moments when nof- nobody hears, and nobody sees, and it's, and it's terrible. It's like he's playing at the piano, and it's, it's like, this is just terrible. I'm glad nobody's going to hear this or ever know about it. Um, in the privacy of his own room, I'd like to think that. I have a feeling it might not be, or that his brain works in a way that he kind of gets the good stuff, and the process is... I'm so quickly throwing away all the bad stuff that it never even sort of appears, even in his brain. Whereas for me, the bad stuff is right there all the time until I beat the shit out of it and find the good stuff, which is a much harder, slower version of it, I think. I think he's, he's got a brain that's just like lightning and it just goes, shit, 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 great, there. <laughs> like that, straight there. And whereas the rest of us are just digging that crap out of there trying to find a good bit and it just takes us longer so it was it was a wonderful terrifying interesting experience as well and I, I like to think that I mean one of the things was as well I didn't know how far away I could go from the genre as it were and and the filmmakers between Ron and and uh, and, and uh, Kathleen you know Kennedy who was wonderful as well and the editor as well they were all like as if they were hearing things and I was sort of doing things slightly wrong for the genre, they kind of liked it. So the fact that they were kind of saying, ooh, this heavy percussion stuff is quite interesting, let's just see where that goes, it, it, gradually they gave me a little bit of kind of um, confidence to pull it a, further away. But because I had John's stuff, I, I knew I could make that, I could make the link, I could keep the link, and cl- including this one cue, which is really a John Williams cue, just with sort of like kind of a bit of remix of me underneath. And it was great fun because it's one of my favourite cues of, of the original Star Wars. And I'd always wanted to really play with it. And, you know, <laughs> I, and I, I got to play with it. It was great fun. Um, and then since that, I, I, I really like the Mandalorian stuff because I think, you know, it helped everybody go, oh, maybe we can just kind of head out, you know, of this world a bit into these other worlds. And if you think about it, it's such a, it's a, such a huge sort of palette of, of storytelling it makes complete sense that you know now we everybody can go off in lots of different directions. So that's, that was fun. I think. Um, building on further on this fairly eloquent <laughs> insight into <laughs> your uh, the composition and process, so to speak, um, how broad um, is 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 your role, not just as a composer, but in the whole, let's say post-production process in terms of filmmaking. I know you are very keen into these things. I know your personal studio is very far away from your house, is it in your back gardens? So. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, and I, there's lots of composers who, who don't. John Williams, for instance, you know, I work with, uh, often with uh, Sean Murphy, who's his engineer, and John will rely on Sean to get a sound, and make it, beautiful and he'll be at, he'll John will be in the room with the orchestra conducting and he'll occasionally check it but he's never in the weeds of kind of production really he'll say when he doesn't like something but he he lets everybody else kind of do their job you know he hires the right people do the job it's a very common thing I'm a bit of a control freak so I like to play in, in everything and I'm fascinated by sound and I'm because I there's lots of other music that does totally different things that you have to work a different way. I mean, if you get into the weeds of why Massive Attack is great, then you start to sort of look at Spike Stent mixes, you know, as well, as the process that it took to get that there. 
ends with Spike's stent doing the right kind of mixing. And then why is it that he doesn't, does he use reverb or no? It actually turns out he's using delays that are filtered where you think you'd use reverb. There's a lot of kind of widdly little details about every sort of thing that I get fascinated by, in, including, you know, obviously, Revelian orchestration. Why does he do that? You know, and why do these guys record that way? Why does that record sound amazing? Um, I love it all. I do play with it all. So I'm a big one for sort of going into the production of it, trying to produce it. It's, sometimes it's a bit like doing a record, you know, and, and records can be made, you know, in the old days they used to make records, of, you know, they used to take nine months to make a record. Um, they still do, but just not in expensive studios anymore. And we have to sort of do it really quickly and effectively and efficiently. So the production techniques of different types of scores and these hybrid scores where you've got, you know, kind of all sorts of percussion and weird instruments and choirs and huge orchestras and I love it because it's all kinds of music. I get to play in those playgrounds all the time and put them together. So we were talking about the fact that, you know, you've got an orchestra here, you've got a world-class orchestra. It's a great orchestra. They haven't done a lot of film scores because it's such a weird world to get an orchestra to do a film score nowadays, especially nowadays. The, the thing that orchestras have to get used to is the way that we make film scores now. It's not classical music except for when it sounds classical even then it's not necessarily made that way there's lots of really strange things we we do for film scores we record things lots of things separately stripe it so i rarely record whole orchestras at the, ta at, the at the same time a lot of this is for just getting it onto the dub stage in a way that can be balanced with you know a million sound effects. I mean, the, the sound guys have, you know, so many tracks, and we now have lots of different tracks because we really do, when, when the sound field is so complex, you have to have elements. You have to have elements. So there's technical reasons why we do things. And it's really unmusical. It's very technical as to, you know, we, we were playing around with this when we were doing some recordings. And it's a thing that orchestras, it doesn't take long. And, and, and the players are here, are, 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 they're brilliant players. But, you know, we were messing around. It's like, why would you do that? It sort of is very against the idea of making music. Yes, I agree. But in the end, it is going to make music. It's just we have to sort of do it this slightly unusual way. Uh, and then, and, and also as a control freak in me, I like that because I can really kind of get in and get to the details. And I like recording the brass separately. Why? Because... You know, it's not because I don't want a grand sound coming out of the orchestra all at once. It's, I love that. Of course I love that. But when I get to record brass sections alone, I can do a thing with the players, which is that I can say to them, there's no strings here, there's no winds. You can fucking give it some willy. And they blow their sh <laughs> lips off. And as long as I'm careful and I don't hurt anybody, we will have fun. And then you get this recording that kind of is really hard to do when everybody's in the room. You know, to do that, to get that kind of sound, you A, have to write properly, you know, so... And you can look at the classical repertoire and sometimes people have done it brilliantly and sometimes people, even brilliant composers haven't, where you, you never really have the brillante sound out of the trumpets because it's in a range that would wipe everything else out. Except, you know... Ravel always can do it. He does it right. I don't know why. We, nobody can ever figure out why Ravel's orchestration is always right wherever you record. But other times you can get it. Marlowe can sound magnificent, but you have to have a big enough room. You have to have enough air in it. It doesn't need to be a wet space, but it has to be, it has to be air. So there's physics, and all this kind of stuff comes into this stuff. And like everything else in Hollywood, we can sort of fake it by recording the brass separately and we can get them to play way louder than they would, and you get this kind of brillante sound that I just love. I mean, I always, I always say, you know, horns, French horns should always sound like they're chasing you, you know. Um, trumpet, trumpets are a, a rhythm instrument, they're a percussion instrument in my head, not nothing else. And, uh, and trombones should not be, never be facing you, ever. They should always <laughs> point it, and unfortunately they always do. So, I, <laughs> you know, um, but it's just a giant sort of, hole where you basically, if I'm not careful, if the mics are in the wrong place with trombones, I can always hear like the, the back of the 
player's throat. It's, that's what it always feels like. So I have all these kind of weird and wonderful techniques that I play around with. And musicians enjoy it. I remember once in Los Angeles, I discovered um, how to make piccolos when they're played very high. They can just, again, you can't hear anything else. If you write too high for them, it's just a nightmare. And I had three piccolos playing on this thing, really high. So I thought, how am I going to do this? Is like, are we going to do the piccolos separately? And that, that seemed like a failure on my part, if I did that. And I discovered something, which is the piccolo mute. And uh, the piccolo mute is very large, thick sombreros on each piccolo player. If each one plays a, sits there with a sombrero this size, <laughs> like that, and plays, um, it brings down the sound of the piccolos by 3 dBs, which is just enough, just enough to now get those really high parts to not rip your head off. And, uh, and I must say, the kudos to the players in Los Angeles who <laughs> sat there playing these, these parts <laughs> with giant sombreros on. So, so that's the kind of thing I, I enjoy, but it's also, I think, a little, under, a little weird for players to understand in other parts of the world, which is why it's been fun playing with the orchestra here. You know, in London, they, you know, they, they think I'm nuts, and they know that everybody does these weird things. In Los Angeles, they know I'm nuts. And we experiment and we try things to try and get a, something, you know, out of the music. It's always, I, I always try and get something interesting in the music. And even if it, nobody notices, it's sort of it's something at least I can pursue. And some of that is just these, these techniques that we have to or have to use, or, or, or even deliberately not doing it the way everybody else does it. And, you know, and say, OK, I'm actually going to record everybody at the same time, but we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to change the way we lay out the orchestra. I've exper ex been experimenting with orchestral layout, and that's really interesting as well. I mean, you, you get a hell of a sound. If you look photos of, of early scores being recorded in film scores, very different. You know, they, they bunch everybody up in the room and they put one mic over them, and it's really strange because they were in mono as well. And so all that play of the production of things, I, I, I do find... Very, very much of, uh, one of the things especially I enjoy. And also by that time you've also written the music, which is really the hard bit. So now you're getting to play with everyone. You know, so. um, within uh, the framework of this film week, uh, the, the, the strategy and the vision, so to speak, for, for the upcoming years uh, in terms of the film industry was, was launched as well. Um, Building and basing also on your work in, in recent weeks with, with the Malta Philharmonic Orchestra, um, where do you think um, our country should aspire to, to move in the coming years in terms of this post production? Um, in terms of production, the, as we were talking earlier, Malta has a fairly strong standing, if, if I may say. Um, in terms of post-production, what, what, what's your advice? Where do you see the... Yeah. It's, it's an interesting... I mean, you know, here I am. I'm, not, I'm visiting the country for the second time, really. I was here when I was young, uh, on holiday, like many, many Brits. And um, I remember it being beautiful. I remember trying to sort of water ski with a pair of water skis that had been pinned together with a thing. And <laughs> terrible. And I remember very, very much remember... Um, <laughs> A strawberry sponge cake. I, uh, why I remember that, I don't know, but isn't it weird what comes back from your, from your childhood? So you have a beautiful country, you have a sort of a... But you actually have a... You're right in the middle of so many worlds. That's the amazing thing about it. It's like you can't really sort of spot where... Mil where is Malta? You know, it's like it's, it's the sort of the accumulation of, of a giant part of the earth. The question is, in film, we've just gone through a, a period when, you know, everybody, you know, we, we were doing film scores in LA where everyone recorded at home individually. And that's a hell of a thing to try and do. Everybody's getting Zoom now, you know, and we've all discovered how easy it is now to do. You know, people just love it because they don't have to go travel, you know, all the travel. I mean, ironically, I have traveled all, all the way here from Los Angeles, but, you know, it was Malta, so I had to really come. The question is, we're, I think we're in a different age now. I think people have got so used to working remotely. I think people 
you know, are also now everywhere are, are much more educated, you know, as to sort of, I don't know, what, what it takes to be in the industry. So you guys are clearly kind of laser focused on there might be another market for us to be able to develop here, which is we have a very good orchestra and we have internet and we and and uh, and you know, and that's the question of of really it's just if if the players sort of are, it, it's very much I think it's going to be about the players if the players are want to sort of be part of that market they'll see why everybody does these kind of weird things and why they have to sort of sit around with headphones on all the time and listen to clicks it's it's not the mu the f most fun musical world to be in but the other thing is that there's an economics of it that you know and i love the players in london and i love the players in in los angeles and everybody around the world gets paid musicians get paid amazingly different amounts in, in around the world it's a, it's it's extraordinary, you know, and essentially you can go anywhere in the world and you're a violinist halfway back in the second violinist can probably play a concerto just as well as, you know, er everywhere else because the standard is required for orchestral players is very, very high in the world. It, it, and that's why I'm not a player. I couldn't do it. I was, I was, I realized I was never going to be able to be good enough to be a player. So that's why I became a composer. Um, and so if you've got great players and the will, and you've actually got great halls, um, good internet, uh, tax rebates, you know, it, the economics of it are such that everybody in Los Angeles, sure, but we're still all recording in Prague and, you know, London and Vienna and lots of different places and everybody's kind of getting better at it in different places around the world and some people, and then they, then, they, then the economics creep up on them and then they become more expensive in other ways. It, it's, it's a global market. You know, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that as a son of a, of a musician. You know, I mean, my standard of living was given to me because, you know, there was a union in England that fought hard for musicians' rights and, and, some, and, the, and the money and everything. So the difficulty is when you're in Hollywood and, and you've got a film that's... 150 million and they're telling you no we have to record you've only got this amount of money to record and you're realizing well the only place i can go is somewhere where you know people are, the standard of living is is lower and you know the prices are lower as opposed to in los angeles where yeah they you have the finest musicians but you also have very big prices and so it's a i'm torn all the time about this this side of the industry is very hard um, but ultimately, I think it's. I think the responsibility you have as a composer is that you're still a musician. The thing you should be trying to do is get the best music you can, and get the most musicians on it. That's always been my thing. It's like, well, how? It's better to go somewhere where I can afford 100 musicians than play with 10 musicians. If if that's what will make the music better, I should really try that. You know, and the sort of the the difficulty is sometimes you know film composers get paid so much that I mean we should just <laughs> you, you're, you're asking yourself am I am I holding on to my money so that I can squeeze these other guys you know there's a lot of guilt in me about all sorts of things especially about this so it's it's a very hard it's very one hard hard one to talk about but I think if you pursue the best music you can with the most musicians, I think that that sort of, for me, means, okay, well, that's a better reason to do it. You know, because you, you can only, so, you, there's only so many times you can turn to a giant corporation and go, come on, guys, you've, you, you've made $1.6 billion on this film. Why are you, um, you know, why are you only willing to spend this amount of money? Why are you not willing to do it union? Why are you not willing to, you know, sort of pay people properly? Well, it's, it's a private company, you can do what you want. It's, there's nothing, I can't force them to do that. I have to work within their rules. I mean, I, I did, I, I've done a few films where I've given two budgets for a film, which has said, if we do it here, it'll cost, I'll, it'll take four days. If you do it here, it'll take 14 days. Because it's just gonna be hard to do there. Because these guys 
They're used to doing that, and these guys aren't. And so if you really want me to go there, it's, um, we have to build the, the budget to last a lot longer. And that would be the other thing, is that, you know, the economics are such, including the amount of time it takes. And sometimes you don't have time as well. I, sometimes I've actually had not enough time to record a score because it's so late and the dub's coming and there's so many other pressures that you, you, you really only have four days to record a score. If there's any questions in your brain as to will we get through this score in four days, you go where you know it will be good. But then there's other times when you've got time and you want to experiment, you know, and you want to play. And sometimes it's just too expensive to play in this place, and that's why you might want to go to another place and, and sort of try things, you know, and build in enough time because you know the, the, the quality of musicians is high, but the, the cost of it is, is a fraction. Now I'm going to be able to play, I'm going to be able to try other things out. You know. So there's all sorts of reasons why you go to different places. Uh, some of them you're just forced, some of them you cannot go anywhere other than Los Angeles because of union agreements. And sometimes you cannot record in Los Angeles because of union agreements. Um, and then there's, you know, there's also just, you go to Malta and you meet everyone and you like them and then you think, well, I, let's try something there. <laughs> you know, which is why it's probably, I've been, I've been tricked to come here and I'm actually enjoying it so much that it will probably result in me doing something here. So. <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> um, uh, uh, latching a bit further to, to this, what we were talking earlier quite struck me um, in terms of Malta's location. Um, it's in a way, uh, it's, uh, it's a funnel of, of different sounds, of different cultures. Um, how important is this for a film composer and how, how it help, how it can inspire, how it can change the whole storytelling, go, going back to what we were talking. Well, the thing is that for me, yes, I, I love throwing everything together. And yes, you sort of are geographically in that place. The question is, you know, one of the things that we have in, in, in Hollywood and, you know, in places that you know is you have... It, it's amazing, musicians from all over the world are everywhere. And so, you know, if you need somebody to play a Duduk, you know, you've probably got more Duduk players almost <laughs> in Hollywood than you have in Armenia. It's amazing. Um, People are also good at doing impressions of what they think cultures sound like. I mean, Hollywood is terrible for it. You know, they're very famous for, for being racist musically. You know, when you see a, a shot of Shanghai, you do hear sort of cliched in Chinese music. Um, and when you look at Chinese music, you realize it's, it's just as deep as... Uh, it's got so much depth that we're completely ignoring most of the time. Um, so what you know, ethnic music is, is, is hard to talk about. Now, I, a few years back, I famously had a, a session on... It was an Italian job, and um, I was playing the music back, and one, somebody said to me, um, why does the music sound so ethnic? Um, and I wasn't... I didn't know what they meant, ethnic, because I, I guess I had lots of different things in there going. I had percussion, and I had, you know, weird flutes, and I had weird, I guess I had a lot of weird things in there and they thought it sounded ethnic. But I was kind of offended by it because I, I, I said, what do you mean ethnic? I said, you mean like Beethoven? And he said, what do you mean Beethoven? I said, well, to me, Beethoven sounds German. So, you know, um, <laughs> so ethnic music, I don't know. The question is, you know, you've got a symphony orchestra that's playing, you know, a repertoire that isn't, you know, doesn't touch really the kind of... It's not representative of where you are in the world of music, world music, but that's the great thing about music. Everywhere people play different things. I mean, you, you, you could be in, you know, you could be in a sort of an epicenter of being able to get musicians from around, you know, the area, from the, from the Mediterranean, from North Africa, to come and play on things, and that could be a really interesting thing for people as well, for composers. But we do tend to sort of fake it, or we do tend to sort of search out people. Uh, and often, I must admit that you kind of get... I was recently in New York, and I managed to do a pretty good impression of a Bulgarian women's choir. Um, there we found, we found some women who, who sang with that particular technique. On solo, I'd gone to Sofia to record, because I didn't think we'd be able to find any um, enough sort of 
who could make that sound. Um, but we did in New York, so who knew? I mean, that's the thing about music is that people just, you know, or, or nowadays, again, it's like if you want to record with some unusual instrument, I bet there's somewhere in the world that you could send them the track and, and then just do it over Zoom as well. That's coming about a lot more as well. So I, I don't really know the answer to that one. I think, I think that one's a little less um, important than economics and... And, and musicians will. I think that's what's going to sort of make the difference in, in, in this particular situation. So. Um, a final question from my end before opening again to the floor. Um, ah, we have a question, so actually yes. we can... Thank you, I apologize. I shouldn't stand and talk. I am not a musician. Uh, but I've worked in the film industry in, in, in various departments. First of all, you know, I want to state, I'm sure on behalf of everybody else, how lucky we are to have a musician and an international artist of your caliber come here and share the nitty-gritty of how it's done. <laughs> this we never meet. Uh, I was very lucky once because I, I was a friend of a flutist who invited me one morning in Rome to go and see Ennio Morricone score uh, the film by Corbucci La Veneziana. I sat next to Corbucci behind the glass and uh, there was Ennio Morricone there conducting only five instruments. <laughs> All right? And they played this passage and Corbucci was <laughs> and very humbly Morricone came along and said, look, but here this, the score, Okay, let's try it again. They did this five times, and uh, voices were rising, so my flutist friend gave me the signal, and we left. With the impression, A, this is the first time I thought that the musician actually met the director, and how poor the recording studio was. I've been to some recording studios in Malta, and I wish that somebody invites you to see them, and they are quite sophisticated. Mm. And that's all I wanted to say. Right, yeah. Well, I, I am going <laughs> to... Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a tour of uh, a few places that uh, I've already seen on, you know, kind of uh, Zoom, and I, I love to get into studios and have a listen. But, but yeah, it is interesting that uh, even at, for Morricone, you know... Um, Filmmakers can be total dicks, uh, but they can be. You know that's the truth of it. But so can composers. They can. They can be. Uh, I've met a few composers that are dicks, and uh, you know it's an industry full of amazing people and a few, just a few assholes as well. So, so. <laughs> um, so um, I've been told that we're nearly there. So, yeah. on behalf of the. Malta Film Commission, I would first of all like to thank you for being present with us here. I would like... <laughs> and of course all those joining online. Um, I think you can join me in thanking Mr. John Powell for being such a wonderful speaker and for sharing some insight on this fantastic world of, of films, of, of, of arts. Um, and uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, for us from the Malta Philharmonic Orchestra to be collaborating with the Malta Film Commission um, as part of these events of the Malta Film Week and we look forward to, before we mentioned, how Train Your Dragon um, mm. that will pop up in some way on Saturday so we invite everybody to watch uh, the Malta Film Awards. Thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.